It's time I come clean. About my mill. No, no, it's not a character flaw or anything irreversible like that. This mill is great. It just has some issues. Like this. And that thing. And probably most alarming of all, this. Yeah, I know. These problems have been accumulating for quite a while. I normally don't remember them, though, until I'm in the throes of a project, and stopping to correct the issues just never seems appealing. But this poor old thing just can't take it anymore, and frankly, neither can I. These issues are not only costing me my sanity, but also costing me money. Literally. So today these problems are going down. We're just going to jump right into this one and start on the most alarming of issues. The god-awful racket the gearbox makes. Seriously, do you hear this thing? That can't be right. It only happens when I try to adjust the speed above a certain point, which is why I've been working around it. But because I can only run the mill up to 150 RPM in low gear before having to jump up to 600 RPM in high, there's a big window of common speeds I'm completely missing out on. Speeds I need, otherwise I ruin end mills. Yeah, not cool. What's probably the worst about this is it's been a problem since I inherited this mill from my grandfather. So what's the actual problem? Well, I'm not 100% sure, but I have a pretty good guess. The speeds in this mill are achieved through a continuously variable transmission belt drive, otherwise known as a CVT. It's basically a V-belt between two pulleys that can open and close. This movement changes the diameter the belt engages on each of the pulleys, which changes the drive ratio and thus changes the speed of the spindle. The width of the belt is critical to this mechanism working though. It should be about an inch and a half wide. But where does mine come in? Oh boy. Only an inch and a quarter wide. I'm going to go out on a limb and say I found the problem. Well, I guess I'd better get another one of these on order. And while I wait for that to get here, I'll get started on... Oh, excuse me. Man, deliveries these days are just getting out of hand. At any rate, this looks like a belt, so let's swap it out. The belt is oh so conveniently tucked away in this housing, so I have a little work ahead of me. Luckily, I have instructions. It looks like it all starts with removing the motor. I'll isolate the circuit, then detach the motor switch from the mill so I don't have to worry about unwiring anything at this point. I'll also go ahead and remove this cover from below the motor shaft. Well, if that isn't supporting evidence for a worn belt, I don't know what is. I have a feeling I'm going to be finding a lot more of this. Now I have to run the speed selector to the highest setting. I assume this is to relieve the spring pressure on the motor pulley so I can remove it using this bolt. But there's no obvious way to prevent the motor from turning so I can loosen this. Weirdly, an almost identical set of instructions for an actual Bridgeport mill seems to omit this step altogether, so I'm going to skip it as well. I'll go ahead and remove the two motor mounting bolts, then try to finagle the belt off the pulley. I can't really see what I'm doing here, so I doubt you can either, but I'm basically trying to do the reverse of how we learned to get a bicycle chain back on when we were kids. Get it started over one edge, then spin everything by hand to walk it off. Hey, that worked. Hopefully it's as easy to get this back together as it was to get it apart. Okay, this side of the drivetrain doesn't look too bad at all. Some minor surface rust, but that's to be expected. I'll get this cleaned up in a bit, but first let's get everything else apart. Off comes the drawbar impact to gain access to the bearing cap, and this is held on by three screws. But for some unclear reason, the instructions say to immediately thread them into their adjacent holes. Ah, how clever. These screws also help lift the housing off the bearing. What thoughtful engineering. Well, maybe only semi-thoughtful engineering. They aren't quite long enough to get it completely free so a little assistance from a pry bar is needed. From here, it's just a bunch of hardware. A couple of connecting screws hidden down inside the housing, the four bolts on the top, disconnecting the speed selector. Oh, and I can't forget this little guy back here. All right, if I got everything, this should just come off here. 
Oh, come on, muscles. Put your back into it. There you go. Okay, now we can finally get a proper look at this belt. Oh, yeah. This thing is toast. Just look at it compared to a new one. A significant amount of rubber on this thing just evaporated. Well, maybe evaporated isn't the right word. It's absolutely scattered all over the inside of this housing. All the movements in the CVT must have caused the belt to wear. But I suspect this is the original belt from the manufacturer, putting it at almost 30 years old. So even though it's in awful shape, that's still really impressive. It also looks like I did reorder the correct belt. I was slightly worried about this since, well, the manual is a little sus. But we're good to go. I guess that means I have to stop procrastinating and start de-rubberizing everything. Woohoo. Okay, that wasn't actually all that bad. I settled on just cleaning up what I could reach without further disassembly. I've got a lot of other stuff on my list, so no sense in obsessing over a little fluffy rubber that isn't hurting anything anyway. Okay, let's get this all back together. It's usually never a good sign when the wood stick makes an appearance. So that method I used to walk the belt off the pulley during this assembly doesn't seem to work very well in reverse. Probably because this fresh belt has 30 fewer years of flexibility training. There is another way, I just wasn't looking forward to it. Mostly because of this spring. I'm going to have to piece this back together inside the mill. First going in with the lower half of the pulley. Then bringing in the motor with the top half, which was surprisingly easy to get realigned with the lower pulley. But that's where the easy part ends. Now to get the spring back on. Okay, yeah, I'm not going to manage this with brute force. I can almost get the spring there, but to hold it and start the bolt at the same time is just too much. I need a way to hold the spring compressed so I can fiddle with the bolt. And I think I have an idea. I'm sure you're as skeptical of this as I was to start. But the more zip ties I got on here, the more confident I became I wasn't just making a potential energy bomb. I hope. Sweet. Though this is looking a bit sinister. Okay, I'll stop pressing my luck and get this on the mill before it pops. That compressed the spring just enough that I can get the bolt started by hand. Then I can just cut out the zip ties and come back in with the impact to tighten it all down. That actually worked perfectly. I'll just get the last couple things on here and we can give this a try. Okay, here goes nothing. Oh my word, this is amazing. I can take this all the way to the max drive ratio without a hint of rattling. I've honestly never seen this mill running in these ranges before. And high gear is the same story. I rarely need to get up in this realm, but it sure is nice to be able to now. This is going to make using this machine so much nicer, I can't even tell you. And I'm especially excited not to ruin any more end mills. At least not from running them at the wrong RPM. I should have done this so much sooner. Learn from my mistakes, folks. With that major problem out of the way, I can get started on the next phase of the project. Yup, that's right. I'm finally going to install that VFD I bought over seven months ago. In a nutshell, this mill needs three phase electricity, but my shop only has single phase. So this static phase converter has been taking that single phase electricity and making three phase so it can run. Well, sort of. It only creates the three phases for a second or so to get the motor spinning. Then it skips along on a single phase and only performs at half its rated power. That's where the VFD comes in. It will take my single phase 220 volt power and make continuous 220 volt three phase electricity. I've already made this upgrade to my lathe and it's made a world of difference to not only the power of the machine but also how quietly it runs compared to before. 
Needless to say, I'm pretty excited to finally have this improvement on my mill as well. But just because I've had all this time to plan its installation, doesn't mean I did. So I need to get a few things on order to finally complete this project. So what did I order? Well, I got an enclosure, a disconnect switch, a cooling fan, uh, oop, how did this get in here? Uh, a couple cables, some cord grips, and some zip tie mounts. Is this all really necessary? Yes, the answer is always yes. With the mess this mill makes, it would just be a matter of time before a chip worked its way into the circuitry and, well, kaboom. Plus, this model has some nifty shielded vents on the side for circulating air to help keep the VFD cool. And I'll give you one guess as to why I chose this enclosure in particular. Any takers? Oh yeah, it's got chamfers. The real question though is if everything will fit in here. Hmm, there should be a key on this thing somewhere. Surely they didn't lock it inside. By George, I think they did. Okay, that's a little less stupid, but only slightly. Let's get all this junk out of the way and see if this is going to work. It's a little cozy, but I think I can make do. The clearances are a smidge under the recommendation for this VFD, and I knew this when I ordered this panel. But I was really attracted to the pre-installed vents and mounting spot for a cooling fan, so I'm hoping that this extra circulation will make up that difference. There is one small issue, though. The knob just hits the door when it's closed. Hmm. Well, that was easy. Everything else looks like it's going to clear in here as well. I guess it's time to get all this together. I've got a few holes to pop in the shell, so I'll start with those. This disconnect switch will be the primary shutoff point for the incoming power. I wouldn't say it's strictly needed here though, since I'm placing this whole box right next to an outlet where I could just unplug it. But it will make this setup look a lot more professional. The switch is pretty deep though, so I just need to make sure to locate it so that it clears the VFD inside when I close the door. The next set of holes is for some cord grips. These will anchor the cables to the enclosure so they aren't inadvertently yanked out by some clumsy goof. Drilling larger holes in sheet metal like this can be a bit tricky with regular bits, so instead I'm starting the holes with a manageable half inch drill, but then using a taper drill to open them up the rest of the way until the cord grips fit. The last holes to drill are actually inside the panel for mounting the VFD itself. Again, I'm just making sure to locate it with even clearances all around before marking and drilling the holes. Alright, that's all the chip making out of the way, so I'll get this cleaned out and we can start mounting things. First, the cooling fan. This panel came ready-made for a 90mm fan, so this is as easy as installing the fan on the mounting plate, then reattaching that inside the enclosure. The cord grips are next. One for the incoming power, one for the signal cable, and the last one for the power out to the motor. The VFD is held in place with four sheet metal screws, then four more screws mount the disconnect switch to the door before the cover and knob are pressed in place. Okay, let's wire this sucker. I guess I'll start at the power source and just work my way down the line. First is a plug on the end to connect this to my 220 volt wall outlet. Then routing this cable through the cord grip and to the disconnect switch on the door. Though once I'm inside the panel, I don't need this stiff sheathing. So off it comes to make this more flexible. I have two hot wires and a ground, so I'm only connecting the two hots for now, making sure to bring these in on the line side of the switch. I'll strip another length of sheathing off the cable, then connect the matching red and black wires to the load side of the switch and run them back towards the VFD. I don't really want all this dangling around in here though, so I'll secure everything with some adhesive zip tie mounts. This is actually the first time I've ever used these little guys, and I gotta say, they really take my cable management addiction to a whole new level. I'm glad I got a whole bag. These also help with the bundle of cables that traverse the door hinge. There needs to be some slack here, but I also don't want them to get pinched by anything as I close the door. Now I didn't notice this until the cable came in, but the third conductor I intended to use as a ground is yellow, rather than green. But yellow is kind of like green, so I think it counts. I'm just kidding. I'll probably circle back on this later on and mark this with some green tape. I'll get a ring terminal crimped on here and then mount that to the grounding stud in the box. And also add another properly green grounding wire to feed to the VFD. Speaking of which, I'm ready to connect this bad boy. I'll get fork terminals crimped on the two hot wires coming back from the disconnect and the ground wire from the enclosure stud. Then screw these into the correct locations inside the VFD. 
and that's all the incoming power taken care of. But I still have this fan to deal with. It will probably be annoying if it runs all the time though. Fortunately, this VFD has built-in programmable relays for just this purpose. I just need a power source. This fan is good up to 240 volts AC, so I can simply piggyback off the 220 volt power coming into the VFD, connecting one hot leg to the common terminal of the relay. The fan should only draw a fraction of an amp, and this VFD's relays are good up to 3 amps. But just to be safe, I'm including an inline fuse. The output side of the relay then runs to one lead of the fan, and then the second hot leg gets connected to the other. After a little more cable management, that's all I can do with this sitting on my bench. So let's get this mounted on the wall and connect it to the mill. This should do nicely. I'm not going to need this old plug anymore, so I'll get this off here and fish this cable in through the cord grip on the enclosure. And if it wasn't completely obvious, the motor gets connected here. Three wires, one for each of the three phases, the order of which isn't important right now. Then the ground wire joins the crew on the enclosure stud. Almost finished. The last thing I need to figure out is wiring in the control signals that will tell the VFD to spin the motor. I'd really like to use the mill's existing switch for this since that's what I've grown accustomed to. So let's get this out of here and do some rearranging. Alrighty then, I guess I'll need to do something about that too. One thing at a time though. I no longer want the motor's power to pass through this switch, so I'll disconnect the leads, then just wire nut them together. I'll draw a hole in here for a new cord grip that a signal cable can pass through, and might as well try to make this all look sorta nice. I'm ready to mount the switch, but that's not happening with this busted bracket, so I'll make a new one. And you know what that means. Not too shabby for being made without the mill, and it seems to fit just like the original, though one of the screws was missing when I took this apart. Before remounting the switch, I'll figure out the terminals I'll need for the forward and reverse signals to send to the VFT, connect the three leads of that signal cable, then remount the switch and hardware. But not without cracking the faceplate first. Very important not to skip this step. Back at the VFT, I'll fish the signal cable into the enclosure, then connect the three leads to the inputs yellow to the digital common, red to reverse, and black to forward. All right, after triple checking that everything is secure and in the correct location, it's time to power up. No smoke, no flames, no sparks. That's a great first sign. Just a little more work programming this thing and we'll be ready. There are a staggering 184 parameters to set in here, but fortunately after installing this exact same VFD on my lathe last year, I got that learning curve out of the way. Plus, the vast majority of these aren't really relevant for this simple integration. So I just have to take care of ramp times, power curves, input and output settings, and of course the motor ratings. If I don't enter these, I could easily fry the motor, and then I'd have a real problem on my hands. Okay, I think that's it. Time to see if all this is gonna work. Spectacular. Come on, Brandon, what did you forget? I guarantee it's right in front of you. There you go, buddy. Usually helps to turn the frequency knob off of zero. But hey, it works. And on the first try, I might add. That's a heck of a lot smoother than the lathe went. And man, this is so much quieter than before. There is just one eensy weensy tiny issue. The switch is reversed from the original spindle direction. Luckily, this is easily fixed by just swapping the forward and reverse inputs on the VFD. There we go. This is such an improvement over the old phase converter. I really should have installed this sooner. It's a bit overkill for what I need since I just need it to make three phase electricity. And the mill has the CVT, so adjusting speeds is already easy. Though I suppose if I want to go really slow, that's now possible. I still have some other issues I want to rectify in this mill, so let's address probably the most annoying one of all. This absolutely awful wobble. 
A long time ago, my grandfather put the mill on this rolling base, which is great for moving this behemoth, but not so great for keeping things steady. I did my best to use the built-in leveling feet, but they just aren't beefy enough, and the mill also rocks within the frame. As bad as it looks way down here, it only gets worse the higher up you go, and it doesn't take much to get this thing shaking. The mill is pretty rigid by itself, so this probably isn't affecting my parts, but the constant shaking just isn't pleasant to work with and definitely makes filming a pain. So I've decided it's time to ditch the rolling frame altogether and anchor everything to the ground. No really, I'm actually going to bolt this sucker to the concrete. Only obstacle is getting the mill out of this frame. I think I'll be able to manage that with this hydraulic toe jack I ordered, but I don't know what they were thinking with this packaging. Sheesh. I also got some rod anchors for the concrete, a masonry bit to drill the holes, some two-part anchoring epoxy to lock the rods in those holes. Oh yeah, I'm really committing to this. And of course the jack. With this toe jack, I'm thinking I can lift the mill one side at a time, working supporting blocks underneath. Then sort of just juggle them around to get the frame out of here. In theory. Hmm. Now that I'm actually thinking this through though, this is a terrible idea. I sort of figured once I had the jack, I'd come up with a way to use it. But no dice. The potential for dropping the mill on my head is just too high. So much for that idea. Good thing this jack is unused, so I can probably just return it. And if they fight me on the state of this packaging, well, you guys are my witness. Really, my biggest problem with this frame is that the loading points are just so far out. But I can negate all that if I just put some supporting material directly under the corners of the mill without removing the frame. So that's exactly what I'll do. I already leveled this machine a while back, so I should be able to just make four blocks each at the correct thickness to maintain this level. And to measure what each of those thicknesses needs to be, I'll use a highly specialized tool designed specifically for this job. Transfer punches. I say that as a joke, but seriously, this is the most I've ever used these. Not a super precise measurement, but the 64th graduations will get me within 15 thou. Which is precision enough to get me close-ish to level. With all four thicknesses determined, it's finally time for something I've been looking forward to all project. Some actual freaking machining. These will be mostly out of view where appearances shouldn't matter, but that's just not how this shop works, so I'll go ahead and clean up these sides first. Alright, that's four leveling blocks ready to go. Before I put these in place, I do have one more mess to make. I need to drill the anchor holes in the concrete. And as for locating those holes, I'll just use the existing holes in the mill base as a guide. Or not. Of course the three-quarter masonry drill is 30 thou oversized, obviously. Like who doesn't know that? Well, I guess this leaves me no choice but to first enlarge the holes in the mill's base a little bit. This should be fun. That was not fun. But now the hammer bit fits so I can get back to what I came here for. Oh boy, this is going to make a mess. Hang on. There we go. I've had this hammer drill for years, and I gotta say, it's really gotten me through some stuff. Given a fresh bit and some numb hands, this bad boy can get through just about anything. But there seems to be something particularly hard about this concrete, and it's really giving this drill a run for its money. Luckily this drill is my old faithful, and it's never failed me before. Oh dear. My old faithful is no more. Moving on to plan B. My trusty Milwaukee has a hammer drill setting I've never really taken seriously before. But I guess I have no choice in the matter now. Hopefully it works. Well, I'll be damned. This is no joke. It's at least as good as the dedicated hammer drill. I guess I won't need to worry about a replacement. After cleaning out the dust from each hole, that's all the preparations finished. Let's get the anchors in here. These are really just threaded rods, so to actually secure them in the hole, I'll use an anchoring epoxy, which should just be a matter of filling up the hole, pushing the anchor in while twisting it, 
and according to the instructions, these should be ready to load up in about an hour. So I guess I've got some time to kill while we wait. <clears throat> Let's kill that time a little more productively, shall we? No reason we can't see how the leveling blocks fit. Hmm, well, it's still rocking. I guess that's no surprise, though, since I've got four points of contact here, so it's teetering over the highest, too. The real question is how much is it teetering? Indicator says, 42 thou. The solution to this is really quite simple. Shave another 42 thou off the front left block. I guess my transfer punch technique wasn't as clever as I'd thought, though it did get me close. Okay, now that's more like it. That completely removed the rocking. I doubt I even need to anchor this. Though I am curious now how close it is to level. So what does the high precision level say? Okay, yeah, not as awesome as I thought. This isn't super critical though. But I do wonder what it would take to get this bubble closer to center. I'll just drop some shim stock under the low end in each direction. Looking like 5 thou high in the back and 19 thou high to the right. Scaling that up to the spacing of the support blocks, that jumps to 17 thou higher in the back and 32 thou higher on the right. Well, I guess since I already did all this math, shaving a little off of each of the blocks shouldn't take too long, right? That wasn't totally necessary, but look! Bubble is within a few tick marks of center, which is only a few ten thousandths across the length of this level. That's pretty snazzy. Even better, the anchoring epoxy should be dry now so I can bolt everything down tight and might as well get all the old caster hardware out of the way. It's all just a trap for chips at this point. Now for the final test. How's the rocking? Jesus Christ, I thought this was solid before, but now this? This is solid. Literally, my whole body weight can't budge this. It's like a monolith embedded in solid stone. I am beyond pleased with this improvement. No, I'm beyond pleased with all these improvements. It's extremely tempting to push aside small fixes like this in favor of starting a new idea or diving into a new project. I'm definitely guilty of this. But honestly, caring for the tools is just part of the territory. They need love too. At the start of this little endeavor, I had a noisy, shaky, hobbled mule of a milling machine. But now, now I have a stallion. A powerhouse of metalworking magnificence. Ready to charge forward anywhere from 15 to 4200 RPM streaking along at full horsepower without so much as a hum. A rock-steady colleague in our pursuit of beautiful finishes. In addition to making a more pleasant milling experience, I know that the time spent on these upgrades will pay enormous dividends on the next project. So, what will that project be? We'll just have to find out. As always, thanks for watching, and see you next time. You ready? Yep. I gotta not be smiling. <laughs> you can't even do it. <laughs> Jesus Christ. You're having too much fun with this. <laughs> I threw a box in my head.